until I got married, and that only continued when I had children. But God continues to refine me by His grace through close relationships in my family. As for my leadership as a father, I learned that I had to teach our children that they were not the center of the universe, nor were they the center of the family. They did not rule my house, but God had placed them in a family for them to learn to give, to sacrifice, to love, starting with their own siblings. In order to do this, they would have to bend their wills and they would have to be willing to give up some of their selfish desires for the sake of others in the family. Sometimes this went well. Other times, guess what? It didn't go so well. I wanted them to learn that by God's design, family functions best when you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. So our children learned that there are times when they were able to get what they wanted, but most of the time, they'd have to learn to deny themselves, to deny their own desires, and consider others in the family in order that the whole family might be blessed. They could not always have their way. Now, there was a time when we taught this in a very practical way. It seems like this was something that we always had to, to deal with, but there was a time... And that was on their birthday. On their birthday, they got to choose what meal they wanted to eat, what cake they were going to have. They got to choose what game we got to play. They got to choose maybe where we were going to go. And guess what everyone else got to do? Be happy about it, right? <laughs> Be blessed by it. They had to rejoice with them. So we started a tradition in our home, and actually it still goes on today. I don't think we initially intended it to be a tradition. But as we sat around the table on that birthday day, we would go around the table and say to the other children who was not the birthday, what are you thankful for for this child? Or what God-honoring characteristics do you see in his life that, that we could highlight and say, we're blessed that you're that way. We're blessed for your actions here. And so we started this, nothing bad, only blessing. And it went on, by the way, our children are all gone now, but the last birthday we had, it still happens. And it's a great time. You see, the honorable conduct of learning self-control and speaking blessings to others honors the father and mother. It also brings blessing to the child that's willing to speak it. And it inspires a God-honoring kind of family. Need to practice honorable conduct and what that honorable conduct looks like. First, he's told us that one of the big things about honorable conduct is submitting. We are to submit to authorities. And he gave us the pictures of that. Submitting as in citizens to the government. As in employers to employees. As in wives to husbands. And then last time I got to get in the face of our men and myself and say, Husbands, live with your wives in understanding. But you know, Peter didn't stop there. He added, and show your wife what? Honor. And I challenged you last week. One of the challenges that men, that God's given us as men is to outdo one another in showing honor to your wife. That's not what this sermon is about, but let me pause. How you doing, guys? Kind of silence, huh? Should ask your wives. No, probably shouldn't. How are we doing? Oh, I got one thumbs up. That's good. Just want to remind you, again, the big context of this passage from chapter 2, verse 11 and following, is honorable conduct. And I believe that's the same thing he's talking about here, but now he shifts. It's no longer about the wife, particular. It's no longer about the husband. Now he says it's about all of us. How many of you are all of us? Thank you. I got a hint. All of us? All right. So God's speaking to all of us here. This is what Peter says. He gives it very clearly. <laughs> By the way, the big idea here this morning is that a caring community practices this honorable conduct. That blesses one another. You see, God has revealed himself as a relational God. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune. They work together in perfect harmony all the time. But he's also created us in such a way that we need relationships. We need each other. We need comfort. We need sympathy. We need love. But also we need to give that love, comfort, and sympathy. It cannot, these things cannot be understood nor expressed apart from a family, apart from relationships. So let's look at how Peter describes these, beginning in verse 8. He says, finally, all of you. Who's all of you? All of us. Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. He's speaking to the church. And he's telling this church, here are some honorable conducts that will be healthy, will be a blessing to us, will be a blessing to the church. And he lays them out for us. Peter gives us a picture, if you will, of what a healthy church should look like. He's also telling us that those who are redeemed, those who are exiles, those who are now part of the family of God, they are the ones that are cultivate this. These are the things that we should pursue among one another. Five of them this morning that I want us to think about and to consider how we might cultivate these within our church family. Let's dig in. Five God-honoring qualities of a caring community. The first one he spells out here in verse 8 is unity of mind. Now this doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything. But it does mean that we need to strive to be agreeable. We do not divide over peripheral issues or preferences. There's no reason to do this. What color we're going to paint the wall. What color the carpet is. Or whether we're going to pave the parking lot or not. Or whether, I mean, you could go on and on. you got a glass pulpit or a wooden pulpit. I had that problem in the past. There are all kinds of preferences that don't really need to divide us, right? These are just preferences. We can disagree on these things and still be agreeable. I can agree with you and I can disagree, but I love you. That's what a family does, right? You think just like all your brothers and sisters? No, but when you get together, we need to love one another. And we can, think, can accept them in, in some senses of where they are. Now, in a church family, there are many things that are not essential. And those non-essential things we can have different opinions on. But somebody has to make a decision. Now, when it comes to essentials in this unity thing, there's, these are more important. When it comes to essentials, this is different than non-essentials. What I mean by this, we're not going to have to be able to have a church if we disagree on the person or the work of Jesus. In other words, if, if you believe Jesus is not God, we got problems. If you believe that Jesus was only a man, and you want to be a part of this, I think you're not going to fit in. Or just the opposite. If you believe he was man, I mean, he would... You got it backwards. Whatever. You know, if he's 100% man, 100% God, that's what I'm saying. You got to believe both of those. The incarnation says that Christ came from heaven to earth, and he was perfect in all he did. And that is really important to the very bedrock of what a church should be. The other aspect of that is what he came to do. That is the gospel. And so the gospel is very center of the gospel, is that if you, of who Christ is, if you mess up with that, you're in trouble. If you don't believe in his sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning, propitiary work. Well, that's all big words. What's sacrificial? Christ sacrificed his life for us on the cross. I should have died. He died in my place. Substitutionary. That's the picture. He substituted his life for me. Atonement. That means his blood cleansed me. It fully paid the price of sin on the cross. And propitiated just means the very fact that that Jesus himself took on that sin, and particularly the, took on the wrath of God for sin. You start messing up on those things, and you've got a cult. Now, for Baptists, we have even one other important unity, and that's the Baptist faith and message. That's why we're Baptist. And those faith and message, we can say we agree with other like-minded churches, and we can, we can work together on those things. There's lots of them not going through them. But particularly for Baptists, we believe in believers' baptism. So that's a unity thing in our church. We would say we don't baptize infants. We baptize those who have come to faith in Christ, can understand it, can explain it, 
That's important. That's who we've always been. That's what we believe the Bible to teach is more important. And so we would say we would unify around others who believe in believer's baptism. We have a congregational polity here that, that leads with eldership and, and deacons. Those are all things that would unify us. But let me share with you a little bit about, since I've been here, how the elders lead in our congregation. As elders, and this, this, is, this is a unity question, as elders we work together both on the essentials and the non-essentials. Now, most often we're dealing with issues of non essential That does not mean we don't have differences on these non-essential things. We do. Essentials we, we have to agree on. We, we can't really work together. But on the non-essentials, what we seek to do is discuss the things together, and we show love. Love demands two things. One is that if I have a difference with another elder, I listen. Now, you don't get to see and peek into these little meetings, but I will give you a little bit, okay? You, we get, I get to listen first. That's my starting point. Hear what my brother's saying, and then I can speak after that in love. So in our meetings, we do have those differences at times. You don't always know of them. I'm not going to tell you them because I think we need to be unified. But my point is that we work together in these things and we work them out and we love one another. We're often continually affirming our love toward one another, even in the difficulties of making decisions. I love you, brother. I love you, brother. This is important because I'm not coming against you as a person. We're just trying to work out some of the details. It's not about attacking someone. No, I love them. We're working together for this unity. That's my point. We are called to care for the sheep, brothers and sisters. It's not about me. It's not about Keith. It's not about you. Know, the elder. It's about how do we love and lead God's people in a way that's healthy and honorable to God. And it's not always easy. Christ is ultimately our leader. We confess that continually with one another. And in doing that, we have to listen to him. So we got to pray. we got to open his word. We do this regularly. We, we have to listen to what he has to say, and we have to see how that's going to fit into where God has put us as a congregation. He leads us in unity and one heart and one mind through his wisdom, through his power, through his word. How is that possible to have unity on these nine essential kind of things? Well, there's a passage. I don't have, we don't have it up here. But, but James chapter 3 Verses 17 and 18 gives us how we should work through this in wisdom. Let me read it for you and just briefly explain this before I go to the next one. But James gives us a picture. He, he, he says there's two kinds of wisdom. There's a wisdom that comes from the world, and there's a wisdom that comes from God, and those wisdoms are different. And he says those wisdoms that come from the world, and he describes all of that. I'm not going to take you there. I just want you to see the wisdom that comes from God and how we seek to use those very things in our meetings as leaders to bring us together in unity. Here's what Peter say, uh, James says. Remember, James was Jesus' brother. But the wisdom is first, uh, or excuse me, but the wisdom from above is first pure, it is peaceable. It is gentle, it is open to reason, it is full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Wow, beautiful picture. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see, working together, these truths guide us. These very things help us. Every single one of these, these are good for your family. They're also good for a church family. They're good for leaders. What does it say? In wisdom, that wisdom that comes from God is first pure. pure. What does pure mean? It means that God tells us we have to have a pure heart to see him. That means we have to have a heart for him, not for our own agendas, not for our own selfish ways. Purity says I'm seeking after what is best for the church, what is best for Christ to be exalted. I want to have that kind of relationship, not about me, it's not about me getting an excellent, being exalted. It's not about me getting money. It's not about all the, it's about God's honor. I want a pure heart in this. Then he says that purity leads to peaceable. That's the next word here. In other words, we're, we're constantly asking one another and, and seeking to, to live in peace with one another as we bring the church to unity. How are we doing? 
if I can't be peaceable with my brothers, if I can't have right relationship with them, there's nobody out there that's going to have the same. You're going to be able to see. And so I want to love them in that way. Gentle is another word. How do I present things to people? How do I share? I'm not harsh and angry and bitter. I'm gentle. I'm not saying that we're perfect in any of these. Don't get me wrong. But this is what guides us. Then, I love this one, open to reason. That's another one you can use in your own family. It doesn't matter if you're a leader or not. If somebody has a different opinion, well, well, if your opinion is different from mine, then explain it to me. Convince me that yours is better than mine. That's okay. We can, we can have some very good discussions about those things. But a person who's wanting wisdom from above, the Bible says that you are open to reason. That means you're open to hearing from other people. You think about what others say. You work through it. Doesn't mean you have to agree or believe with everything, but it does mean that you're willing to listen, right? You're willing to reason through those. And then you're full of mercy. I'm going to grant kindness, mercy to others, good fruits, impartial, sincere. There's much here. But my point is we work together letting these truths guide us because we desire to live in the God's, under God's wisdom. We believe Jesus will guide us in this way. This is what Christ wants for his church. Be in the, uh, living in this way. So unity of mind pursues, in this passage, peace with one another. And so again, we're affirming our love for one another. We pray for one another. And we know we have this belief that God is one. That he is our father. That Jesus is our savior. That the spirit is our guide. And he has one truth, one purpose, one direction. What we need to do is hear from him. And then come together as, as men. To lead in wisdom. Unity of mind is critically important. God wants his children to be agreeable. We can disagree at things, but he wants us to be agreeable. Second, the thing that Peter writes here is sympathy. Not only should we be uni- have a unity of mind in the church, but we should be sympathetic. Sympathy is just that very thing. Feeling for someone else and what they're going through. Whether it be joy or whether it be sorrow. One of my favorite passages on this is Romans 15, excuse me, Romans 12, 15. Where Paul tells us, you know it, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, in times of excitement, that is, someone has had some success in their lives. Maybe they've been promoted. Maybe they just had a new baby. Um, maybe they've gotten a raise at work. Maybe there's some honor that's come to one of our brothers and sisters. What do we do? We rejoice with them. Same with my children. My my child gets an award, then all the family rejoices, right? We're grateful and glad and happy. There's another part of this which hits our church even this week. There are times, brothers and sisters, that we weep with those who weep. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just stand next to someone who's going through such a trauma and cry. It's okay to cry. It's okay just to stand with them and cry. You don't have to say anything. I mean, God leads you to say something, sure. But there are times that we just stand with them because they need someone next to them, and we just weep. Is that not what Jesus did, at least initially, in the story of Lazarus? Well, first of all, he paused. He knew the time to show up. But when he showed up, the, the scripture is very clear. The first thing he did once he saw Lazarus in the tomb was to cry, to weep. He wept for Lazarus, but he also, I think, was weeping for Mary and Martha. He saw their, their loss, and Jesus cared. And his response was to, to enter into sympathy, if you will, with them. He cried for them. So what does this mean for our church family? Well, brothers and sisters, it means this. It means go be like Jesus. As my brother's already said, go, show up, stand next to them, and and if if need be, just weep. But three things I want to share with you quickly in this situation, where we are today. First of all, certainly you can pray for a brother and sister. Pray for them, but I also urge you to pray with them when you have the opportunity. Not just pray for them, but be with them and pray for them. The second thing is, find a passage of Scripture that the Lord has given you or maybe has helped you through time of difficulty or, or, or maybe you were reading this morning in your daily time and it just really kind of leaps out at you and you, you think of 
maybe Susan and Stephen or Lori and Cliff who are, who are just coming out of a surgery. It comes to your mind, that person, as you've read that verse. Well, if so, then the Lord wants you to take that verse and send it to them or share it with them or text it to them or say, I'm praying for you about this. I hope this encourages you in some way. Don't fail to move forward on those things, brothers and sisters, to show that you have... It's not just enough for your elders, your deacons and their wives to do this. Although we should, it's for all of us. Remember? I just read there. For all of us, I urge you all to do this. As I know some of you have already. But pray, read a passage. The third thing is presence. Go stand next to them. Your presence can say so much about how you care for them. Certainly, you can say things like this. I'm, I'm so sorry this has happened to you. Just that simple thing. You're saying something that's sympathetic. I'm sorry this has happened to you. Or you could say something like this. I hurt with you. I mean, let's not be insincere. If you don't, don't say it. But if you are, say I hurt with you. I love you. I'm praying for you. These are just some ideas. Or can I pray for you now? Can we stop and just, you know, five-second prayer, whatever it may be. Stop and say, because that says to them that are going through difficulties, I care for you. Have sympathy. That's what Peter says here. Third, brotherly love. Brotherly love is brotherly affection. It, it, it's, it's kind that you have for a brother and sister in your family that you love dearly. Your blood brothers, your blood sisters. I remember two different times in my life I went through some very difficult hardships. Two times I was removed and became a pastor. and I won't go into all the details there. But one of those times, I remember very clearly... I was pretty distraught, and I have two brothers, and they both live in Birmingham, that's where I grew up, and I remember one of my brothers calling me up on the phone and saying, hey, we've got a house here, and we were renting it out, and the people just moved out, you want to just come and live in it for a little while? And I said, yes. <laughs> and then my other brother called me, and he said, how can I help you? And I said, well, Dan, these are my dear brothers, I said, Dan, I really need somebody to cover my medical insurance, I don't have any money right now. Just count it done. Later, I was lamenting to my brother, my younger brother, how inconvenient I had been with them. He looked at me, and I'll never forget. He says, but Rick, that's what families do. That's what families are for. <clears throat> You're right. Brothers and sisters, we have a family here, Gordon Baptist Church. And when someone is in trauma and hurting... What do we do? We love them. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid you're going to mess up. Don't be afraid you're going to say something crazy. Just don't say anything if you think you are. But love our brothers and sisters the way we would love our brother and sister that is in our own family. Really. This is what this word means. It means brotherly affection. You see, you can help in a way that, quite frankly, they're unable to do right now. Have you ever been through trauma? Have you ever been through grief? Have you ever been through pain? But you're so stunned, you don't even know how to think. You're so stunned, you don't know how to make decisions. And so go and just stand by them. Help them to think if they need to think. Help them make decisions if they need to. Most of the time, they just need somebody with them. They need somebody to stand there with them and be with them. And so we say to them, hey, I'm, I'm here with you. You're part of my family. You're part of the Corden Baptist Church family. And I want to let you know that I care for you. We care for you. We're here for you. These ways can be expressed in families right now. I think, again, of, of Lori and Cliff and, and Susanna and Stephen particularly. And, of course, their children. That we can go and help them, pray for them, be with them. So what would God have you do? Well, think of it this way. If I had a brother and sister that had a need, what would you do for them? How would you act with them? What would you do for them? You wouldn't ignore them, would you? No. You would try to help them in some way. That's brotherly love. He digs even deeper, if you will, in terms of the motivations of our heart when he says in the next word, you're to have a tender heart. And so we love with a tender heart. A tender heart is opposite of a cold heart. It's opposite of a hard heart. In other words... You hear someone's need and you listen and you respond. You don't ignore it. 
I have a part-time job on eBay. Most of you know, I've talked to you about it before. And I work with tools. And in doing this and, and cleaning up tools and boxing them up and putting them in boxes, I often get cuts on my hands. And so there are times that I might have a cut from a razor blade or from a tool or from something that, uh, you know, gets a little sore, infected, it hurts. And it sometimes when I get uh, that, that cut on my finger and I bump something, it starts to scream at me. You ever had one of those? Man, they just scream. Now, what do I do? Do I scream back at it? Not usually. Maybe sometimes. But usually I don't scream back at it. What do you do when you get a hurt or a cut on your hand? You find medicine, right? You put the medicine on. You bandage it up. If I'm going to work somewhere else, I'm going to put a glove on it so when I hit it, it won't hurt me so bad. I take care of it because it hurts. And I recognize that when the cut is deeper, it's going to take longer to heal. It's the same way with relationships, brothers and sisters. There's some deep relationships that hurt. And it's going to take a long time for that to heal. And what do we do? We stand with them. We bring the healing balm of Jesus the King of Kings to their life through the Word, through prayer, through encouragement. Again, tender heart requires us to be tender, to be careful, to listen, to pray for them. And there are times when we go through difficulties that seem like unbearable weight. Those times may be self inflicted loads. They could be our own sin, could they not? But many times they're not. They're just tragedies, as we saw this week, a tragedy. Could be, though, people are going through surgeries or sickness. I mean, you could go on and on about the difficulties and the wounds that come into our lives. But what are we to do? With a tender heart, we're to go hold their hand. With a tender heart, we're to stand beside them and hold them up until the strength of the Lord can, can come. Pray for them. Encourage them. You see, honorable conduct for the family comes through a willingness to have a tender heart toward that person. We need tender hearts of love, particularly in a crisis. This is where it shows up the most clearly. We always need tender hearts, but particularly during times of difficulties. It's not a time to come in and beat on them. It's a time to come and love them, right? A tender heart. Last of all, a humble mind. We are to do these things with a humble mind. The opposite of a humble mind is a proud mind. Pride goes about trying to make things about myself and what I want or to make me look good in the eyes of my siblings. You know, I can do this so Mr. and Mrs. so and to look at me and say, oh, that's a great pastor. If that's in our heart, Lord, get rid of it. Pride can easily sneak in and rob us of the joy of blessing others. It can make us... These actions be of self-interest rather than of giving. Where do these actions of caring and loving and humility come from? Brothers and sisters, they come from Jesus himself. We only have to look at his life and think about him and we'll find these all are from Jesus. Because he lived out each one of these characteristics perfectly. Remember, Jesus best friend, or we can say it this way, Peter's best friend was Jesus, or at least one of the three. Peter was the one who defended Jesus in the garden. When they tried to take him away, he pulled out his sword, and you're not going to take my friend. Wow, there went the ear. Later, he was confronted by someone, namely Jesus. You're going to dishonor me. You're going to turn away from me. You're going to be disloyal to me. And what did Peter say? No way. No way. My point is, at least he believed he had a good relationship with Jesus. And if you have a good relationship with someone, you spent time with them. If you have a good relationship, you've watched them, you know them. In this case, Peter had been with Jesus quite a bit of time. Three years, obviously. At least it shows us what Peter believed about Jesus and how he had watched Jesus' life. There's no doubt in my mind that he had seen in Christ's life unity of mind. Sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, a humble mind. He's describing Jesus. Now, by the way, Paul says the same thing. Philippians chapter 2, let me read it to you the first couple of verses. See if you don't hear these five same things there. Paul spells out that Jesus' example 
was this. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from His love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, any sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being, being in full accord and of one mind together. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. I need to read verse 4. But all three of those verses we just hit on the four thing, actually the five things that Peter brings up. For in verse 1 he says, if you have any encouragement, comfort from Christ, that's tender heartedness. He says, from his love, there's the love, brotherly love. Any, any of you have, then, then you should have the same mind. Any affection, any sympathy, it's actually the same word in Peter. Any sympathy from Jesus, <laughs> he's saying, then you do the same. You be like-minded. Be of unity of mind. There's that word. And then he says, do things in humility. Actually, we find in the rest of that verse, was it not Jesus' chief ultimate characteristic that he was a humble man? He, hum he humbled himself. The, whole, the rest of that verse talks about it. Keith brought it up weeks ago in talking about uh, serving and washing each other's feet. The chief characteristic of this passage is that Jesus was willing to humble himself from heaven, come to earth, and serve us and die for us. This is what we hear and see in Peter. All five of these characteristics are seen in these verses as well as 1 Peter. And so, this is how we are to live. Why? Because Jesus has gone before us. He is our motivation. He is the one who's lived out this perfectly. He is the one who is our hope. He's the one we can turn to, and he's the one that can give us the power to even live these things. He first shows us how by telling us to do these things. Then he gives us a picture of himself. This is the way I want you to live. And so I love others because Jesus has first loved me. I give to others because he's given to me. I practice a gentle heart toward others because Christ has been gentle to me. You see how that goes? That's the motivation. That's the encouragement. I am humble because my Savior was humble. And so humility serves and looks like this. I help expecting nothing in return. I pray not wanting to be noticed, but to bless. I make much of Christ, not of me. Matter of fact, I don't even think about myself. I'm not in the picture. No, I want to honor Christ and so I have a tender heart toward others for his sake. I show brotherly love because Christ has loved me. I strive for unity because he has brought me into his family with others. And I belong to his family. These five God-honoring qualities are what makes a caring community, what makes a caring church. And then he gives us two quick actions that flow out of this. In verses 9 through 12, this is actually a quote from Psalms 34. Notice what it says in verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Two quick things. In our actions, we are to bless others, not revile. That's what verse 9 talks about. We are not to repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. To pay, repay evil for evil is not to forgive, but it's just to get back at someone. In the family, in relationships, whether it be at home or at church, we're going to sin against one another. And God demands that we are willing to forgive. What happens in your, with your children when they don't forgive? What happens in the family? And it, if it's like mine, there's more fighting. There's more conflict. There's not peace. It's chaos. The only way for blessing to come when there's relationship broken, when they're sinning against one another, is to forgive. To give forgiveness and receive forgiveness. Now I recognize, brothers and sisters, that to 
give forgiveness is often harder to even ask forgiveness, is it not? Because you've been hurt. And when we get hurt, what rises up in our own hearts? You sinned against me, and I want justice. I want to get you back. Matter of fact, if you can get, if you can be hurt like I got hurt, maybe you won't do it again, right? Let, let's be honest. Sometimes we think those kinds of things. You know, it'd be kind of relief if you could get, if God would get them back like that. So that way, maybe they'll stop the sin and make me feel better. The truth is, sin hurts, and sin hurts. It's very painful often. But what does God demand for us? Not to revile against someone, not to repay evil for evil, but to forgive. Now, Peter is stressing that if evil has been done to me by my brothers, I must forgive. But how do I know if I've forgiven? It's in this verse, really. This is how we know. Can you bless them? If you've forgiven someone, you don't hold that sin against them, and you can bless them. How do you bless them? You pray for them. You serve them. You say kind words about them. Can you speak kindly about someone who sinned against you? That's where we know whether forgiveness is in our heart or we're holding on to bitterness. Bitterness rots the soul. It tears up, it destroys, and it destroys a church. And so we must not hold on to this bitterness. We must be willing to forgive. Why? Why? Because Christ has forgiven us. It goes back to Jesus, does it not? It all goes back to him. That's my motivation. How can I not forgive you when he's forgiven me so much? Think on that. Dwell on that. So we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed with forgiveness that comes from God that we might then forgive others. We are given his great love that we might give it to others. We are given this kind of love for him that we might then be a blessing to those in our congregation Here's what it says. We are blessed with the unity of mind. We are blessed with sympathy. We are blessed with, with uh, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Now go bless others the same way. Second, live in peace. They're tied together. But he says, here's what a family should do. Here's what makes peace. See, conflict will happen because sin happens. But conflict is an opportunity for us to... To work through the problems and make relationships right with one another. How do we do that? We talk to them. We ask forgiveness. We, we, we pursue them. To be honest in communication. Conflicts allows us to begin to go seek to do good and bless other people. Don't turn away from conflict. Run toward it. Now that's hard because I hate conflict. And the Lord's had to teach me this over and over. But here's the way it's spelled out in this verse. First, he tells us to speak truth instead of lies. Well, you'll never solve problems if you lie to one another, right? If you cover up the problem, if you hide the problem, the only way we can even resolve conflict is if we're honest with one another. To be honest with one another means you need to open your mouth and speak. Now, I'm not saying do it harshly, do it gently, but we must address the issue. And addressing the issue means we open the mouth and talk. We have to speak about things. Even if we're wrong, we can be corrected. Second, we do good instead of evil. In other words, we actively pursue not wrong thoughts, not evil thoughts, not added wrong attitudes. We actively pursue that which is good. In other words, we think, okay, in this situation, if I was in their shoes, or if I was in somebody else's shoes, what would they, what would I want them to do to me? Can you think of it that way? What would I want them to do to me in this situation? That helps us think of how to do good. And then, of course, the third one is pursue peace. Again, they're all together. But to actively pursue peace means I'm actively trying to make the relationship right. I take the initiative. No matter if you've been sinned against or if you sin. What does the Bible say? If I sin against you, what does the Bible tell me I'm supposed to do? Go. Thank you. If somebody else sins against me, what am I supposed to do? Go. 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 Now, that's hard to do. But the picture here gives me a picture of a retriever. I, I really, really just latch on to this. And bear with me, brother. I'm not much of a hunter. But when you go duck hunting and you shoot a duck down, you have the dogs with you, right? You let them go, and what do they do? They go get them, right? I mean, they'll jump through water. They'll jump through snow. They'll do anything to get that duck. 
That's the picture of pursue here. The picture of pursue is that we are to pursue the person who we've offended or has offended us. And we do nothing lack of getting to them. And so we have no right when relationships are broken, whether it's in your own family, with your own children. Now, obviously, there's time and ways to do this. I get it. But at the same time, we can't drop it. We must pursue. And so that's the picture that I get here in this word, pursue. This retriever hunting for a dog, we should hunt for peace. We should not give up till we keep, from our part, from our responsibility, seek that peace. Now, I realize there are times people don't want to forgive us. People don't want to talk to us. Those things happen. But from my perspective, I must pursue. I must be like that retriever. I must be like the hound dog. Just keeps going on and on. And here's the promise. Verse 12. The promise is if we live this way, it is honoring to God and he will bless our relationships. He says in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and its ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The warning is if you live evil ways, if you live selfishly, if you live for yourself and don't care about other people, then God's t- a face and his blessing turns against you. That's what he says. So in conclusion, God desires that we pursue honorable conduct within the church family. And this is how we function together as a family. He's given us the parameters. He's given us the clarity. He's told us how we are to seek to live. Unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Now, brothers and sisters, we have multiple opportunities this week to live this out, don't we? I could apply this to many different situations. I already have some. But let me urge you, think about this passage. Pray about it. Then as God shows you, and maybe he's doing it already right now, he wants you to move forward, then simply take the steps. Don't wait for someone else to to go and do it. You do it. Don't wait for someone else to come alongside those who are hurting. You come alongside. You give. And as, and as Keith said, when you, when you get the, to the place where you can serve this morning, I mean, at the funeral home, if there's something there's need, just go get it. Just go do it. So what if five different cases of water get there, right? Just try to help in the way God wants you to. Because finally, all of you, this is the way we all are to live. This passage is for every single one of us. And so I pause here, if you will, and ask you the question, what has God stirred in your heart this morning that you need to do? Let me urge you, just do it. Just step out in faith. Maybe fear, maybe concern, just do what God wants you to call, calls you to do. And I want you to leave this morning ready, encouraged, and equipped to live out these very truths. Why? Because this conduct is honorable to Christ. This conduct points to Jesus. This conduct promotes a healthy, honoring, God-relating church. Honorable conduct makes the church a compelling community. Honorable conduct gives us a place to be a light in the midst of darkness. I pray our church will be this way. Let's pray. How about you this morning? Where's God stirring in your heart? What is he asking you to do? Is there someone in need? Maybe someone I've not even mentioned this morning. There are others who need help. I only brought two families because they're in great need. and We need to stand with them and love them. Have those people treated you this way? I know Lori and Cliff have. What are we going to do to help them? Be sympathetic, brotherly love, tender heart, humble mind. Oh, Lord, I pray that your people will respond with great love and compassion. And I ask, Lord, that as you stir in their hearts to help, that they would be willing and bold to step out and do the very things that we as a family should do together, to love each other and to love others. Lord Jesus, you've done this for us. May we also give in the same ways. And through this, Lord, would you use our actions, our attitudes, our words.
to be a light in the midst of this dark world, that others might come to know Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.